divisibility of criminal statutes, and the modified categorical analysis of immigration consequences. When you want to determine the immigration consequences of an individual's conviction, you have to use what the Supreme Court has called a categorical analysis. This compares the elements of a state offense of conviction with the federal immigration category to see if the minimum conduct punished by the state necessarily constitutes a violation of the federal category. An earlier video explains the basics of that analysis. Here we are looking at what happens when the state offense punishes conduct beyond the federal category. There are two possibilities depending on the elements of your state offense. If the state offense is simply drawn more broadly than the federal category and is not divisible into separate alternative offenses, then it is categorically overbroad and cannot be used to trigger immigration consequences. This was the situation in the Supreme Court case of Decomp versus United States, which was illustrated in our earlier video. But if the state offense is actually legally divisible into two or more alternative offenses, the Supreme Court has said that it is then appropriate to apply a modified categorical analysis to see which of those alternatives was the offense of conviction and whether that offense is a match for the federal category. So how do we know whether a statute is divisible or simply overbroad? First, a court has to look to the law of the state to determine whether a statute includes alternative offenses with true alternative elements. If so, the second question is whether the alternative offenses as a group are divisible for purposes of the federal category. That is, whether at least one alternative fits within the federal category and at least one does not. We will focus on the first question, which is the more challenging one. This is because not every listing of alternatives within a statute or definition is a listing of true elements. Sometimes a statute may simply list different means of committing an offense that don't constitute true alternative elements. So how can you tell the difference between means and elements? Fortunately, the Supreme Court answered that question too in de Comp. For a variety of reasons explained in that case, including constitutional concerns, the court chose to rely on the indicator of jury unanimity to identify the essential elements of an offense. That is, if state law requires a jury to agree unanimously on which of the alternatives the defendant committed, those alternatives are elements of the offense. If the jury is not required to distinguish between the alternatives, then they are just different means of committing a single non-divisible offense. When looking for the essential elements of an offense, a court can look to a variety of sources, including the text of the state statute itself, state case law, jury instructions, and pattern charging language, as well as criminal treatises on state law or even law journal articles that discuss the offense. It's helpful to look at a specific example to see how this works. The Board of Immigration Appeals applied this divisibility analysis in a case called Matter of Chires. In Chires, the board asked whether a Utah firearm statute was an aggravated felony crime of violence and the crucial question ended up being whether the Utah offense involved the deliberate intentional use of violent force. The board looked to Utah state sources to see how the state defined the required level of intent. It started with the text of the statute, which contained three provisions in separate paragraphs A, B, and C. The board determined from the text of the statute that paragraphs B and C included a deliberate use of force, but paragraph A did not include an intent provision. Under Utah law, that meant an individual could be convicted of the offense for having fired a gun with either intent, knowledge, or recklessness. This collection of possible mental states defined conduct that would fall outside the federal requirement of deliberate intent meaning that the minimum conduct prohibited by paragraph A did not necessarily involve a violation of the generic federal offense. But there was a further question. Could those alternative mental states mean that paragraph A was itself divisible into three separate sub-offenses? To answer this question, the board went back to the touchstone of jury unanimity from de Comp and asked whether Utah law requires a jury to agree unanimously on which of the three levels of intent a defendant had. Finding no such requirement, the board concluded that the alternative mental states were not elements of three different sub-offenses, but rather a listing of three different means of committing the single offense described in paragraph A. So paragraph A was not divisible, but simply overbroad. 
and a conviction for paragraph A could not be a crime of violence because its minimum prohibited conduct did not necessarily involve a deliberate use of force. This meant that the Utah statute was divisible with regard to the required level of intent because B and C fell within the federal category and A did not. If an offense is divisible, a court may then employ a modified categorical approach to try and identify which of the alternative offenses was the offense of conviction. It does this by looking at a limited record of conviction, which may include charging documents, a plea colloquy or agreed statement of facts, sentencing documents, or a record of the verdict. The record of conviction does not include such things as police reports, pre-sentencing reports, or testimony in a later immigration proceeding. The record of conviction may contain enough information to identify the offense of conviction, in which case the court will be able to compare the elements of that alternative offense with the federal generic category to see if it is a match. But if the record of conviction is inconclusive and does not identify which of the alternatives was the offense of conviction, then there is no match and the conviction cannot be used to support immigration consequences. In all cases, the comparison remains a categorical comparison of offense elements, and the facts of what the defendant may have actually done remain irrelevant, even if they are apparent in the record of conviction. What is relevant is the offense for which the defendant was convicted, not whatever facts about the circumstances may happen to have found their way into the record of conviction. In short, the modified categorical analysis is used solely to assist the court in identifying the offense of conviction, from among possible alternative offenses included in a divisible statute. If the specific offense of conviction can be identified, its elements are then compared with the federal generic offense to see if the minimum conduct prescribed in the state offense fits within the federal category. If the offense is a match for the federal category, then immigration consequences can be imposed. But if it is not, or if the record of conviction does not definitively identify any of the possible alternatives as the offense of conviction, then there is no match with the federal category and no immigration consequences can be imposed.